Welcome to Talking Europe. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Today I'm speaking to Ireland's Minister of State for European Affairs. Thomas Byrne, thanks very much for being with us on France 24. Thank you very much. Well, we've got a lot to talk about on just a couple of big stories today. Uh, they'll include Brexit-related issues on the island of Ireland. Uh, but first, I want to talk about the military tensions in Europe that we've all spoken about so much in recent weeks amid the huge Russian military buildup, of course, on Ukraine's borders. Uh, just to give a reminder to our viewers uh, that unlike 21 of the European Union's 27 member states, Ireland is not a member of NATO. The other non-NATO members uh, of the EU being Austria, Cyprus, Finland, Malta and Sweden. Well, since 2014, however, Dublin has been uh, backing EU economic and trade sanctions against Russia over the annexation of Crimea and Moscow's backing for pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine. Just some important background there. Uh, Thomas Byrne, uh, this week uh, we've seen big diplomatic efforts from many corners, including the French president, Emmanuel Macron, who spoke to both the leaders of Russia and Ukraine, as well as Germany, Poland. Uh, a lot of talks, but the troops and military hardware still there. Do you see Emmanuel Macron's uh, diplomatic efforts as being helpful? Well, yes, indeed. We, we fully support those diplomatic efforts of President Macron. Uh, it's very important uh, that we keep talking on this, that we try to resolve this in a diplomatic way, uh, while still be being firm in the resolve uh, and the determination that Ukraine should be able to fulfill its own destiny as a nation and have the right to its own territorial integrity. And, Yes, you're right. Ireland is militarily neutral in that we're not a member of any military alliance. Um, but we're not neutral when it comes to questions of uh, right and wrong uh, in relation to the destinies of states. Mm -hmm. uh, and the European Union, in a united way at the last European Council, warned of massive consequences for Russia uh, if uh, this invasion went ahead. And that obviously would include sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, and the European Union is united on that. And there's nobody neutral uh, when it comes to protecting a major independent country such as Ukraine. Uh, well, as you say, as things stand, the possibility of major new European Union sanctions on Russia are still very much on the table, being prepared by the European Commission. Uh, they would be, we're told, much more far wide ranging than the existing sanctions. Uh, your government would give full backing to those if Moscow made a move against Ukraine? Absolutely. We've already said that there would be massive consequences. Uh, we know what that will be. Uh, and at present, um, Commission and Member States are working together uh, to see what that would be. However, uh, I think all minds on the European side, at least, are focused uh, on trying to ensure and that diplomatic efforts succeed and to mm. give support uh, to those diplomatic efforts. And that's certainly where we, as a neutral country, are focused. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody wants war um, and any of those efforts, particularly uh, within the Normandy format. And I think it's appropriate, of course, France, Germany, uh, Russia, Ukraine, can sit together uh, in the Normandy format, but also France. Uh, this term has the presidency of the Council of the European Union. So I think France is in a uh, particularly uh, influential uh, spot at this particular moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we're very, very happy with the efforts of uh, President Macron and full support. On the other side, though, in Moscow, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has made it clear he wants individual European states to communicate with Russia not the EU as a whole. Ireland was one of the states that received a, an individual letter. Uh, what do you read into this dismissal of the European Union, which has been criticised for being weak in its foreign policy in recent years? Does the EU as a whole have clout with Moscow? Well, I, undoubtedly it does. The, the president of the European Council, for the, the Council of Ministers for the time being, President Macron, has been uh, in, in Moscow, uh, speaking on our behalf, but also speaking uh, as part of the OSCE, uh, the OSCE is there. And I'm not sure that it's really relevant uh, or important as to what Moscow thinks uh, of the European Union. And we know that Russia has never been a supporter of the European Union and will do whatever it can to undermine the European Union. And that's why it's so important for us to remain united, which we are uh, in our focus, and to make sure that the punishment, uh, if this happens for Russia, is those massive consequences that we've already agreed. So mm. there's ongoing work in relation to that. And they will, you know, if Russia decides to invade Ukraine, it will have to pay uh, a massive uh, price, and mm. it will. And inevitably, it will pay its own humanitarian price as well in terms of people uh, dying in that conflict and in terms of the economic prospects of its citizens. And unfortunately, for the last uh, number of years, uh, we've seen the Russian economy not do very well, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we see those areas that Russia has already taken over in Ukraine a number of years ago, really doing significantly worse compared to Ukraine, which is 
beginning to develop uh, and showing its citizens as well uh, what freedom really means uh, and what progress can mean. And I think mm. the citizens of Ukraine seem determined to protect the progress that they've made and not just protect it, mm. uh, but to build on it as well in terms of what they do as a people and as a nation. Just on a wider issue, this whole situation uh, on the Ukrainian border has uh, brought attention back to Emmanuel Macron's argument uh, for several years in favour of a joint EU-27 defence policy, uh, which for him would include some kind of joint EU-27 operational capacity. Uh, given Ireland's traditional neutrality, I'm wondering if Dublin supports this. Well, we're certainly not going to stand in the way of it, and already we do get involved in uh, joint defence capacity or joint defence missions, uh, whether, I suppose, whether it's the United Nations mandate and where uh, our parliament has given assent to that. So we do get involved in some aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of a military defensive alliance, that's not something uh, that Ireland would be taking part in. Mm -hmm. But it is possible for European Union member states to have other formats to do this, even within the European Union, but also, of course, to NATO mm -hmm. uh, and other formats as well. So it's not something we'd be standing in the way of uh, other member states doing. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, uh, a military alliance is not part of uh, what we would see as our destiny. We're traditionally militarily neutral country, mm -hmm. but fully on board uh, with what the European Union proposes to do at this time in terms of those massive consequences for Russia if an invasion were to take place. OK, moving on now to talk about uh, Northern Ireland, where there is, as we know, renewed political instability after the First Minister, Paul Given, uh, resigned earlier this month in protest uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, for our viewers, uh, that is the specific part of the Brexit agreement that was intended to avert trade friction on the island of Ireland and protect the European Union's single market as well. But it has meant keeping Northern Ireland inside the EU's customs union, essentially, highly controversial for some. Uh, Thomas Byrne, your government has a key role, of course, in the Northern Ireland peace process, uh, one of the signatories of the Belfast Agreement. How concerning for you is this resignation and lack of an executive currently in Northern Ireland? Well, the executive ministers still are in office, um, although the resignation of the first minister has caused deep difficulties within the, the government system in Northern Ireland. I mean, from what should be a simple thing like uh, a minister uh, deciding to um, remove pandemic restrictions, as is happening in a lot of countries. But already we've seen in Northern Ireland, they've had to go and check the law as to what they can or cannot do. And even that, to me, is a, a retrograde step. Um, so there's lots of other examples, but that, to mm. me, was the, the, the most cutting one last week. So it's it's very, very worrying. What I'd say, though, is that the, the discussions in relation to the implementation of the protocol, which is already agreed, are taking place between Brussels and London. And I certainly don't want to see uh, what's happening in Northern Ireland distract from that, because actually what's happening between Brussels and London is to try to um, relieve some of the concerns that particularly some unions had in relation to uh, the protocol. Um, the business in general is satisfied with the protocol. Not everybody, but in general, uh, but they want to see some of the measures uh, taken that the EU has proposed. And that's where the discussions are between uh, London and Brussels. Mm. Uh, but what I would say as well is, over the, you know, when I would have spoke to you before, I would have talked about the protocol being potentially the best of both worlds for Northern Ireland, a part of the single market because of the European Union, part of the custom territory then of the UK. Actually, in the past year, we've seen some, we've seen some reality to that. So we've seen companies starting to invest in many cases with uh, thousands of jobs. Um, and they are pe companies who are able to exploit the advantage that Northern Ireland now has to sell goods directly into the single market because Northern Ireland effectively has access to that single market. Mm -hmm. But also in the UK as well, into Great Britain, there, there are no restrictions on the Northern Ireland to UK side uh, whatsoever. So that's a significant advantage. And the protocol is there to protect that advantage. And that's a message that I think we need to be talking more and more about now that we've seen some practical examples of. There are clearly, though, many unionist uh, voices in Northern Ireland who do believe that the protocol is not working for them. They don't see those advantages uh, that you see. Um, what would be Ireland's red lines in terms of tweaking the protocol, given that the UK has repeatedly uh, threatened to essentially rip up the Northern Ireland protocol? Well, look, I've never got into discussion of red lines, but what I would say our position from us from the start is, and our firm position is, the protocol is agreed. It's already agreed between between the EU and UK. So the protocol is staying. Um, what the European Union has proposed, after listening to business, nationalists, unionists, everybody in Northern Ireland, they went up there. Even this week, there was more. There was engagement between the European Union and various interests in, in Northern Ireland, and then they've come back and said, "Look, right, yeah, we, we've heard you." Here's what we propose. 
to do to alleviate some of the concerns that you have while still protecting the protocol and still protecting the single market. Um, and that's where the discussions are. So, so I want to see them, those discussions come to a conclusion. I'd be hoping for progress this month. Mm-hmm. I know the talks are ongoing and they're difficult. But, you know, what I'm saying about the companies that have, have invested in Northern Ireland, nobody can deny that. That's happened. And mm-hmm. um, certainly some unionists feel that if they're getting parcels, for example, from, 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 from Britain, that, yes, there's, there's obviously a customs check. And, you know, they, 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 they're not overly onerous, but I know the commission wants to make sure there is the, own, the, the, the burden is as low uh, as is possible within the protocol. We had the issue of the British sausage as well. But of course, that is, and, and okay, some people uh, want to be reassured about that. And that's, you know, we, 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 we understand that. Mm. But also recognize that the one of the largest uh, pig processing factories um, in the entire of, of Britain and Ireland is in Northern Ireland. So there are opportunities there that I think people need to remember when they talk about uh, particular difficulties with the protocol as well. All right, Thomas Byrne, uh, that is all we have time for, but thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Kat. And thanks to you for watching Talking Europe. Hope to see you very soon for more European news on France 24.